But I want to talk about uh, what really demonetization should serve to be in the future. It's happened in the past. But we all remember certain events in our life where the news of it was so momentous that we'll never forget it. You know, it will remain crystal clear. What were you doing when? So, you know, in the US they talk about what were you doing when you heard that John F. Kennedy got shot. That changed the nature of society or politics of the country. For me, I've had two or three such events in my life for good or bad fortune. As I say, sometimes I was in the basement of the North Tower when the plane struck on 9-11. I'll never forget that. I was sitting at my desk in Mumbai when I got a call from the General Counsel's office saying that the Federal Reserve had asked Lehman to file liquidation. My hands and legs wouldn't move. I couldn't get up from my uh, seat. Not because of the consequences of the fear or the money or anything. I had been in New York for six or seven years. While the whole derivative boom and the trillions of dollars of risk had been created and shared and split. And I could not for the life of me contemplate how the world banking system would continue to exist if an uh, important counterpart like Living Brothers just went into liquidation one night. The system would just break down. There were hundreds of billions of notional risk written against all kinds of parties netted according to your risk model, but that was contingent on every counterparty staying alive. If you took out one counterparty out of the system, the system would just collapse. Luckily, I don't know, it was 15, 20, 30 minutes later, I got a call again from New York saying, actually the Fed has reached, you know, basic IQ level. They said, don't file liquidation, file restructuring. And at the whole core, you know, find restructuring, let the opcos continue to function. It is such a complex matter that here we are about 13 years later, the book is still not fully unbound. Can you imagine trying to do something like this overnight? So I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that I was, you know, after having given up my career as a banker, came to uh, India, stood for election, became an MLA. I happened to go to Singapore to take care of some of my banking affairs because I, ha I had been an expert of PR in, in Singapore as a banker and uh, around 10.30, 11, maybe a bit later at night, I got a call and you know in Singapore it's like 1 a.m. or something like that. So I was asleep already in my hotel. I can remember which hotel, the Shangri-La on Sentosa Island. And the phone kept ringing. Who's calling me this time? It was my wife, and I panicked. You know, my wife rarely calls me when I'm uh, traveling. And she said, oh, you know, the Prime Minister was just on TV. He says the notes are going to go out of uh, value tonight. So I said, what are you talking about? How can you run an economy if you take all the notes out in like three hours? It makes no sense whatsoever. She said, no, no. I said, anyway, we'll think about it tomorrow morning. And I put the phone on and turned around and went back to sleep because I thought she just misunderstood. I could not contemplate that somebody would take such a dramatic decision uh, with such little notice in a country where all the systems are weak or broken anyway. Well, the, the dawn of light didn't bring any greater clarity, it just kept bringing more and more confusion. Till today, I mean, I don't want to get too much into detail because I've written so much about it and I've been so critical Starting with about two days or four days after this, I wrote a couple of essays and I said, even if this is a good idea, which I'm not sure it is, what about A, B, C, D, E, F, G? How are you going to resolve these bottlenecks of problems? And why haven't you done X, Y, Z? So from then, I've been a critic and I've published in many places, I've spoken in many places. This is not the forum to uh, bring that back. But I'll just mention four or five thoughts about how profoundly badly designed it was. Till today, no other country or exercise like this in the world has been undertaken or uh, such taken uh, decision without having the new notes printed. If you kill all the old notes, surely you should have had the new notes printed to supply before you kill them. 
Till today, nobody has done such a demonetization without defacing the old notes after collecting them. Either you, you tear them, you scratch them, you put a punch hole in them. Otherwise, the same old notes keep getting recirculated again and again because everything leaks like a sieve. You barely have enough capacity to bring the new notes down. How are you going to guarantee that the old notes are going back to the RBI in time and not getting siphoned off again on recirculation? So, the really kind of damaging part about demonetization, I think, was that the government's profound lack of compassion, the inability to course correct as the data started coming back. When it became clear that there would be no hope of ever achieving any kind of black money catching, that 100% of the money was going to come back, you had failed, there was no shock effect, the system had beat you. At least they could have said, okay, let the 500 rupee note be legal tender for three more months, saved lives, made sure children had nutrition, you know, that milk and vegetables and supplies actually went through. Because a 2000 rupee note is not fungible. You can't go and buy 50 rupees worth of products on a 2000 rupee note when 86% of the liquidity is taken out of the system. So it was a, such a badly designed uh, uh, effort. Now, one could argue, independent of politics, why are we five years later still writing, translating, releasing books? You know, we hear all the time about how politics and politicians have become venal and the system is corrupt and things are bad. But the reality is that we have elections every now and then. So, if the politicians are bad, if the system is corrupt, then surely Society is not pristine. It's not as if, you know, very good people are electing very bad politicians. Politicians come from society. They reflect society. So, if the system is bad, that includes that the social discourse is not touching the right topics, is not looking at the right issues, at least with not the right level of information or enlightenment. So, nothing is more profoundly important to improving the situation, improving the political climate, improving the quality of politicians, than having the right kinds of debates, the right kind of social discourse with the right data in the right kind of context. This is precisely why the kind of fake news machines and the, and the propaganda machines and the demagoguery uh, tries to prevent that. They want to fill the space with randomness, with the division, with the kind of jingoism, with uh, rabble-rousing. And books like these, translated from eminent authors into regional languages that reach the people, that really is uh, a great contribution to improving the quality of the social discourse. Till today, for example, I have not yet heard an explanation of which law allowed the Reserve Bank of India to say that people can only take out X amount of money from their accounts and not more? I don't know what, what, what part of any law in the books at that day or today empowered the Reserve Bank to do that. Till today, I don't know under what law the Reserve Bank said, as Mr. Franco said, the sign of Urjit Patel on the note. How that, that signature and that note would be valid in the petrol bank, but not in the vegetable shop. Under what law? We are a constitutional republic. We are a democracy. There is still not a clear interpretation of how these things were affected. Never mind that the court still in the, you know, the case is still in court for five years and will never come for hearing in our lifetime. So, if we cannot get clarity in the courts, at least we should have the discourse in the public. This is beyond politics. Whoever had done it, this discourse is still important. Many times, you know, we, we find ourselves not willing to take inputs if it doesn't come from the right source. In many cases, we think the messenger is as important or more important than the message. But just yesterday, I was at a, a meeting. I, I flew in around 3 o'clock on straight to the secretary. The Honorable uh, Union Finance Minister had called a one-of-a-kind meeting, Chief Ministers and Finance Ministers of all the states, to talk about 
the recovery after COVID and how do we accelerate economic growth and so forth. And since both the Union Finance Minister and the Finance Secretary are from Tamil Nadu, and uh, no Tamil very well, uh, in our submission, we quoted uh, a Thirukkural, which said, Eppuru yar yar vai ketunum, Appuru mei puru kandadu arivu. If the truth is the truth, you should listen to the truth irrespective of which mouth it comes from. Right? You cannot say, I'll only take it if it comes from my friend and I'll not listen if it doesn't come from the right person. So these kinds of events, as tragic, as disastrous, as hurtful as they were, they are still things that we should look into. Not for politics, not for casting blame, but for learning lessons. In the essay I wrote on the first anniversary of demonetization, I said, at some point we have to undertake a profound analysis with government data. What really happened? What does it say about the nature of our economy? What does it say about the kinds of transactions that people do? What does it say about the volume of transactions that happen at this price, at this price, at this price, in the informal economy, which we don't otherwise track? But now we have this golden opportunity because of the case study. The same way yesterday, for example, again in this conference with the ministers, uh, our Honorable Chief Minister was in Kanyakamari looking at uh, flood relief uh, operations, overseeing them. So only I attended. And uh, though other states talked about a lot of things, I made a request. I said, you have re reduced petrol prices by 5 rupees and diesel, or taxes by 5 rupees and diesel by 10. In some states, that has made our price come down whether we like it or not, because we do ad valorem taxes. Our taxes are on top of the price that includes excise. So if their excise comes down, the base on which we tax comes down. So the petrol pump also reflects our reduction, which was not voluntary, it was involuntary. No complaint. In some states, because of politics or because of the union government's compulsions, the state governments further reduce the taxes. So can you not undertake a study? Compare what was the impact in states where there was no reduction, what was the impact in states where there was reduction, what was the impact across the country, what is the real elasticity of fuel demand, what changes when you reduce by 5 and 10, what was the second order consequence, are you seeing greater activity because you have reduced the input cost, are you seeing a reduction in inflation in food. This is a golden opportunity, if you make moves, Allegedly for politics because of election results. It doesn't matter. You have made the move. Once you have made the move, you learn from it. Every time we do something, we keep thinking. So what can we learn from this? So if something is done to us, we still say, what can we learn from this? When, we, when the Honorable Chief Minister said, reduce the petrol price by 3 rupees. For the first time, we put in systems that we can track. What happens to petrol demand and consumption if we reduce the tax? The union should do this as well. People should do this all over. The more we have facts, the more we have learning. We are in an incredibly complex world. Running an administration for a government of about 8 crore people, 80 million people in the state of Tamil Nadu. If we were an independent country, we would be about the 18th or 19th largest country in the world. Our economy is about $300 billion. Our budget is about $45 billion or $43 billion. This is a hugely complex task. It is not uh, something that can be sloganeered or surface analyzed away. To improve the outcomes, we have to improve our understanding. We have to improve our execution skills, and we cannot improve our execution skills unless we understand what is really going on. So in that context, uh, such books, I say, should keep coming. Why only one? We should, this is a once in a lifetime, hopefully we will never make this kind of rash decision again in our lifetimes. It's a once in a lifetime systemic shock that should continue to be analyzed, ideally by the government which has access to better data than people in the public domain. But if nowhere else, even in the public domain, analyzed, discussed, uh, distributed, and to reach everybody, it has to be done in the right languages. So I, uh, I have great respect for the authors, uh, Dr. Ghosh, Professor Ghosh, Professor uh, Prabhat Padnaik, and uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar. 
the two translators have done a very good um, work. It's an important book. It's uh, one that everybody should try and read. I thank you for giving me the opportunity to participate. And uh, I wish you much success in the distribution. Thank you.